Wow, thank you. That was so beautiful. Let's give them another hand. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, Oakland City Church. I heard a story the other day that I wanted to share with you all. It was a story about the late, great Congressman John Lewis. A journalist came up to Congressman Lewis and he asked the question, Sir, when you consider the protest movements of our day, how do they compare with the great protest movements of your youth? And Congressman Lewis thought for a minute and he said, you know, honestly, in many ways, they're not that different. It's still people coming together. It's still people fighting for justice and for freedom. It is still people showing incredible courage and bravery in the face of opposition and oppression. In so many ways, they are the same. And then he paused for a moment, and he said, but you know, there is this one thing we used to do that's different. And he said, we used to sing. Now, we used to sing, we shall overcome. Right? We used to sing, it is well, it is well with my soul. He said, ah, they don't do that so much anymore. Right? It's interesting. It's something to think about. In fact, as I look around this sanctuary and, and I think about our church and our community, it occurs to me that, yeah, we too, we used to sing more too. And this morning, we are beginning a sermon series where we're actually going to look at the songs that God's people used to sing. Because those old songs, they still sing loud, don't they? They still sing powerfully. And so we're going to look at the songs that God's people sang to come together when they felt scattered, the songs that gave them courage in the face of hardship and adversity, their freedom songs and their songs for justice. And it is my privilege to open us in the series today. The songs are organized in the Bible into a book that is called the Psalms or the Psalter. There are 150 songs or poems in the Psalter. And when I say poems, I mean like... Poems, all right? They're emotionally rich. They're artistically sophisticated. They are raw and honest and vulnerable, and they speak truth to us in the way that only the best kind of art can do. But this is not just a random selection of the greatest songs. Oh, no, these are songs which were carefully selected and organized into a structure to lead the people of God and to guide the people of God at a to find a sense of new hope or new imagination or new identity or new faithfulness at a time when the things that used to give them confidence had been lost. The temple was gone now, but the Psalms tell us that all creation is God's temple. The kingdom of Israel is no more. The Psalms call us to imagine a new king whose reign will never end. There is now no longer a high priest in Jerusalem lifting up sacrifices at the altar, but the Psalms remind us that God can do a lot with a broken and contrite heart. And one by one by one, the Psalms lead the people of God onto a journey that takes them from dismay and despair and blind obedience to vision and worship and thanksgiving. Not old Torah, but new Torah. The old Torah, the old Mosaic law, in my old life, I had rules. These rules were good for me. They told me what I should do with my land and how I should treat my household and what I should do with my livestock and my clothes and my time. Those are the luxuries of a people who got to own their homes and call their time their own. Those are the luxuries of a people who are not enslaved. In the old law, in my old life, I had a temple. And the temple told me that there was a law I was meant to follow to the letter and then things that I could do to restore myself when I fell short. But those days are gone now. The new Torah is far more concerned with how we meditate on the law than the letter of the law. Far more concerned with how we delight in walking with God day by day than with appearing unblemished in the temple. But you know what? For people who are refugees who are in exile far away from home, to dare to delight is in itself an act of protest. 
to dare to insist on your religious practices when your temple is in ruins is, to, is nothing short of an act of defiance. And to dare to sing, to sing praises to God in the middle of all of this is to make the march of captivity into a march for freedom. And that is what the Psalms invite the people of God into every day. And that is the backdrop that I invite us into as we look at the first Psalm in our series, Psalm 139. Church, will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Psalm 139 is one of the most beautiful, interesting, complicated, and controversial psalms in the Bible. This is because of the ways that many different communities have taken this psalm and wrapped around it and translated it differently and interpreted it with different emphasis and applied it and embraced it as their own. Psalm 139 is what we say sometimes in the hospital, sitting next to a woman who is sobbing because she had just suffered a miscarriage. Sometimes we say to her, I believe you will meet your unborn child in heaven because of Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is what we print on pamphlets and urgently plead someone to read as they are sitting in the waiting room of an abortion clinic. Psalm 139 is what we print on t-shirts, loud rainbow t-shirts, as we call out to a community and say that the church still loves them. When a teenager struggles with anorexia or bulimia, we point them to Psalm 139. We say, your body is beautiful. You matter, don't you see? I know who made you because of Psalm 139. And I think that I just want to start here and name this. To name that the psalm makes space for all of us. That worship, and the psalms are worship, especially worship for a community in transition, trying to figure out unity and faithfulness in a new time. Worship has to make space for everyone. The God of the psalms is one and sure and reliable, but we bring ourselves with all of our differences and circumstances and complexities to the psalm, and the God of the psalm makes space to include us and give us a word in God's spirit. Even the way that the psalm is written and structured makes space for different interpretations. And now, as many of you know, and my girlfriend was like, please do not be a professor in the sermon. I'm going to try my best not to do that today. I would simply invite you when you go home later today or maybe sometime this week, to open up the psalm and read it out loud. Read it all the way through. Don't skip past verse 19 or verse 20. Now, however fast or slow you normally read it, read it two times lower than that. Because I think that what you will find is that there are patterns in the psalm, and the patterns make space to include us. In the first part of the psalm, you see that there are these sentences, pairs of sentences side by side, and two by two they come together to illustrate a single idea. But when you look a little bit closer, you would be surprised to find that these pairs are really interesting. One of the pairs is generally very positive. And then the other one of the pairs, well, maybe not so positive. Maybe a little bit more ambivalent. Maybe a little bit more open to interpretation. I'll give you an example. In verse 7 to verse 10, it says, where can I go from your spirit, O God? And I would say that generally positive. <laughs> positive. And then right after that, it says, where can I flee from you? <laughs> Is there any place that I can go to escape your presence? <laughs> eh, not so positive. <laughs> right? If I go to the highest of the high heavens, you are there. That's positive. If I burrow as deep as I can go and make my bed in the underworld where you are not supposed to show up in that place called Sheol, you are already waiting. <laughs> kind of stalkerish. <laughs> If I travel all the way to the easternmost east place to watch the sun rise in the morning and then run to the westernmost west place to see it dip below the horizon at night, you are with me. Positive. You lead me. Your right hand seizes my arm. And the image there can be interpreted either as a gesture to pull someone out of the mud or to take hold of someone so as to make them a prisoner. <laughs> the same words that can be read as a word of comfort or a defense in the face of my accusers could just as easily be read as a sentence 
a pronouncement of God's inescapable and relentless judgment. The Eugene Peterson message that we read today was a translation that was about the comfort. John Calvin wrote it as a word of judgment. In my translation that I grew up with in Chinese, it was about righteous living. Depending on where you are in your life, and certainly all of us are in different places in our lives, you can read the psalm both ways or either way, and there would still be space for you. The God of the psalm is one and true and sure, and that God makes space to include us so that we could still come together in worship and God, be God's people together. But who is this God that makes space for us? And what do we learn here about that God's character? I think you would all agree with me in that the key is found in those beautiful, heartfelt, and often memorized words of verse 13 and 14, where it says, for you formed me in my innermost depths. Eugene Peterson, you formed me inside and out. Literally, the Hebrew word is you formed my kidneys, my guts. <laughs> it says, you fold me in my mother's womb. I praise you, Yahweh. I give you thanks for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Or as I prefer in my own translation, awesomely and fearfully I am made and am being made. It's not past and done, it's past and ongoing. The psalmist seems to be saying here that I have no reason to fear or be intimidated by or be threatened by a God who about me knows nothing. Oh, sorry, uh, knows everything. <laughs> I delight in it, it's wonderful to me, don't you see? Because that same God was with me when I was nothing. And that makes all the difference. That is beautiful. And I love that. And it is substantiated in many, many different parts of the Bible. But if I were honest, and I'm just going to be a little bit honest. I hope that nobody throws tomatoes at me later. <laughs> but if I were honest, this reading makes me feel a little bit flat. This reading makes me feel a little bit unsatisfying. Because if the heart of the psalm is about my belovedness, then how do we get from verse 14 to verse 19? How is it a worship response to go from, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, to God, will you kill my enemies? I hate them. Destroy them all, God. How do we get dark so fast? And if the heart of the psalm alternatively is righteous living, then surely it would make a lot more sense to go, God, you know me, you search me, you know my comings and goings, you know my every thought, you know the word in my mouth before I say them. Your wings enfold me in the way of life. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. And then connect to, depart from me, you with your wicked ways. I am not fooled by you. Your ways are not God's ways. Oh, Lord, please search me all the more and preserve me so that I can be faithful to you forever. Right, like that. That would be a linear progression. That would make sense. But that's not what it says. And it's not even like the Psalms don't know how to talk in this kind of language. The Psalms talk like this all the time. They simply chose not to do that here. And so I am perplexed. And church, I, I often find that when I have these moments where I'm just wrestling with the text and it's a conundrum, that it is important as a matter of faithfulness and integrity to not just sort of disregard those inconvenient verses. I didn't have time enough to read it anyway. I will just stop at verse 14. But instead, to see it as an invitation to go deeper, to ask the question, and we're reading Hebrew poetry, so even more important to ask a question, is there something that I'm missing? Is there a word or a symbol or an idea that would have made sense in its ancient Jewishness that I, as an outsider and a modern Gentile, would need help to unpack? And then pray to God and the Spirit to direct me in the text. And so I went searching and I started praying and I started studying. And as I prayed and I studied, I felt the Spirit leading me to a really unexpected place. I felt the Spirit pointing me to this phrase, my mother's womb. I felt the Spirit pointing me to the womb. In one of the commentaries that I was reading, they remarked, the theologian said, you know, it's actually pretty surprising and very rare, this sentiment that Psalm uh, 139 verse 14 is talking about. Because if you think about it, the Bible spends a lot more time talking about how we need to be born again and reformed and redeemed than the Bible talks about how good our original birth was. 
Right? The Bible spends a lot more time, in fact, almost all of the time, <laughs> saying more about how we need to be new creation than saying good things about our original creation. This is rare. In the same way, the Bible says a lot more about how God is the creator of cosmos and people and lineages and communities than it talks about God being the creator of a single individual human being. Most of the time, almost all of the time, when in the Bible it says God created you, it's not about my individualism at all. The you is almost always plural. In fact, outside of the creation of Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 and 2, there are only four places in the Hebrew text, four out of thousands in the Hebrew text, which talks about God as the creator of a single individual human being. And every time, all four times, I guess, not every time, there's only four, in all four times the word womb is mentioned. It's Jeremiah 1, 5, Psalm 22, 9 through 11, Psalm 71, verse 6, and Psalm 139, verse 14 here. I believe when you look at the text that every single time these are words which are spoken in protest and resistance. These are words that are saying, don't let anyone or anything take away from you your sense of dignity or your path to thriving or your sense of call. Remember that God was with you in your mother's womb. Even more interestingly, the Hebrew word from womb is a rich and meaningful and powerful word. The Hebrew word for womb sounds like, is deeply associated with, and shares the same root word with the Hebrew word for compassion or mercy, a word that God uses to describe God's self. The Hebrew word for compassion and mercy is rachamim. The Hebrew word for womb is racham. Rachamim, racham. Rachamim, racham. You hear it. It's the same root. They go together. When Israel gets in trouble outside of Mount Sinai and God catches them worshiping the golden calf, it says that God calls the people to repentance and restoration, and God starts to explain and introduce God's own character. And so in Exodus, it says, I am the Lord your God. I am compassionate and merciful. Rachamim. I am the Lord your God, and I am womb-like, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness. I am the Lord your God, and I am womb-like, Rachim. In Exodus or Judges or the prophets, when Israel cries out to God because they're being abused by Egyptians or Babylonians or Syrians or Philistines, it says in the Bible that God is moved to compassion, Rachim. God experiences womb-ish feelings, and God hears their cry, and God raises up a deliverer. Our Rachim God experiences womb-ish feelings and sends a deliverer. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15, now speaking directly to the Israelites in exile, God says, does a woman forget the babe at her breast or the child of her womb? Rahum. Even so, I will never forsake or forget you, says the Lord. And just like with those individuals in those times when Israel has been in danger of losing her sense of dignity or her path to thriving or her sense of call, God has stepped in to say, I am your Rachamin God. I am your God of the womb. So I'm very aware that at this point, right, that there are probably many of you who are thinking in your head, Maximus, you have finally gone completely bonkers. <laughs> this is crazy. You have literally taken one plus one and somehow ended up with the restoration of Israel. I cannot even. And, you, you know, you're probably right. It is kind of crazy, but I'll let you in on a little secret. All of the Psalms is about the restoration of Israel. All of the Psalms is about the restoration of Israel. That's always the way that it has been taught in the Jewish context, that the book of Psalms is an arc about how we can reimagine a new king and a kingdom for the restoration of Israel. And I'm not even surprised by that. Because isn't it true that if you were people who were oppressed and in exile... So no matter what you were doing, what you were thinking, that in the back of your mind would always be this one question, when do we get to go home? And when you think of it that way, maybe it's not so crazy that that could be part of the backdrop of Psalm 139 as well. And I was trying to think this week about an illustration that I can do or some sort of example that would help to more clearly communicate what I think is happening here. And I came up with, and this is a terrible example, um, but 
It's like if I was writing a poem, which is to say that I wasn't trying to kind of like document accurately what the camera would have seen happen a particular day, but I wrote a poem. And the poem went something like, the clock was ticking loudly that evening of November 4th, 2024, as I wiped the orange Cheeto dust off of my envelope and put it in the box. It's a terrible example, but just bear with me, right? So if we pretend that I wrote a poem and the poem went, the clock was ticking loudly the evening of November 4th, 2024, as I wiped the orange Cheeto dust off of my envelope and put it in the box. That someone who is an outsider from another part of the world or many years from now would read this poem and they would go, oh, it sounds like you had to mail something important that day. But for an insider, your brain would immediately go someplace very specific, right? For an insider, and I, I was like, oh, I, wasn't even, I didn't say the word election, and maybe I don't even really want to talk or make it about the election. But as soon as I said November 4th, and then I said 2024, and then I said orange Cheeto dust, it's almost impossible for your brain not to make a connection to something very specific. <laughs> and I think that that's kind of what's happening here. I think that that word womb was put here intentionally and meaningfully for the ancient insiders to make a connection to something very specific. I think that the word womb was put here intentionally and in meaningfully to evoke an association in the mind of that original audience to God's rachamin, to God's compassion, empathy, and deliverance. I believe that it is not by accident that it is the word womb that is used here instead of birth but that the word womb here was put intentionally to evoke an association so that the mind of those ancient insiders would immediately think about God's compassion, empathy, and deliverance. And if that is true, and you don't have to believe me, but if that is what is happening, then the arc of the psalm makes more sense to me. Because I just really struggle with how is it a worship response to go from my belovedness to self-love to hate and violence? but I can completely understand and I absolutely can certainly see the line that gets drawn from God's empathy and deliverance to human dignity to crying out for justice. I get that. Every day around me, I am surrounded by voices and forces that would make me small, that say my life doesn't matter, that say my body deserves to be shamed and trampled, that say my hope is ridiculous and my knees are less than, but my womb, God, my God of Rachamim says I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My womb God says I deserve to take up space. And so God, for those other voices, will you rebuke them, God? Will you get them away from me, God? I hate them, God. This is not your Christian crusades kind of rah-rah. The Bible is very clear on who is the only person who gets to judge enemies. And the Bible is also very clear about what happens when we try to tell God who God's enemies are. This is not the same thing, but rather this is the truly life or death for survival struggle of oppressed people saying, God, please, will you take away anything or anyone or any voice that would lie to my brain about how I am fearfully and wonderfully made? Will you remove anything and, and, and block, right, and just stop anyone or any voice or anything that would cloud my eyes from being able to see your rachamin, your compassion, empathy, and deliverance on my body, on my person, on my life, on your people. In fact, search me all the more, God. Examine me all the more because every day that we are doing this together is a day the oppressor's ways don't win. It's a day that we are walking in your way, the way of my God, rachamin, womb-like, compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and justice, and who will never, ever forget or forsake God's people. And so this poem that can sometimes read a little bit like a, a self-help poem all of a sudden becomes the most magnificent protest hymn. To declare that you are fearfully and wonderfully made when you have lost your kingdom, your temple, and your freedom is to fight a very, very real fight. Wouldn't you agree? To sing that as a diverse and scattered people in captivity is to sing a very subversive kind of freedom song. To cry out to a womb god instead of a warrior god when your kingdom is in shambles and your people are in exile is to stand in defiance of empire. 
It is to say, I renounce you and your military might. I don't care if you conquered us. I have a vision for a new kingdom, and this kingdom is about everlasting peace. It's about justice. It's about freedom. It's about God being close to God's people. Because we're on the other side of this. We know that one day this womb God would come through a human womb and establish a kingdom that has no end and forever exchange fear for love. And so the womb then, not literally Mary's womb, but the womb as a symbol becomes both our resistance to fear and the compassion that saves us and gives us life. Rachum and Rachamin. And in the face of that kind of confounding, overwhelming, challenging, mysterious, and marvelous grace, how can I keep from singing? Amen. Amen.